you turn with me to page 50, our first reading is taken from Genesis 45, verses 1 to 28. Scene is uh, Joseph and his brothers together, and so we read. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Make everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to prepare, preserve you as a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves and so can my brother Benjamin that it really is I who am speaking to you. Tell my father all about the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. When the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, Tell your brothers, do this. Load your animals and return to the land of Canaan. And bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you can enjoy the fat of the land. You're also to instruct, uh, you are also instructed to tell him, Do this. Take some carts <clears throat> from Egypt, from your chil- for, your, for your children and your wives, and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings, because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts, as Pharaoh had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave new clothing. But to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father, ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, and ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they were leaving, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's ruler of all Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they had told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced. My son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. This is the word of the Lord. We'll read together from Genesis chapter 46, beginning at verse 1, on page 51. Genesis 46, verse 1. So Israel set out with all that was his, 
And when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. So Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt, taking with them their livestock and possessions they had required, uh, acquired in Canaan. Jacob brought with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. And then moving on to verse 26. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his son's wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, now I am ready to die since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh and will say to him, my brothers and my father's household who were living in the land of Canaan have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock and they have brought along their flocks and herds and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, what is your occupation? You should answer, your servants have tended livestock from our boyhood on, just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear Lord, we thank you for your promise that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And that's what we're doing this morning as we come into your great and glorious throne room, and we pray that you would rule our lives with the scepter of your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Well, please do be seated. Do uh, take hold of your Bibles and also the uh, sermon outline uh, you were given as you came in. There's no point in looking at the clock. It says five past one. I hope that's not right. <laughs> now, one of the uh, greatest thinkers and uh, Christian writers of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was the American theologian B.B. Warfield. Now, his out work output was phenom phenomenal and his influence immeasurable. Now, what many people don't know is that in 1876, at the age of 25, he married Annie Kincaid. And as they took their honeymoon in Germany, it was during a fierce storm that Annie was struck by lightning and was permanently paralyzed. Now, can you imagine that happening to you? Well, after caring for her for 39 years, Warfield laid her to rest in 1915. And do you know that because of her special needs, Warfield seldom left his home for more than two hours at a time during those long years of their marriage. Talk about dreams being shattered. On this earth, he never saw his wife healed. He never witnessed a turnaround of events. He just exhibited patience, faithfulness, and love. He hadn't planned it that way. But at no point did he believe that what had happened was outside God's good purposes. And it was having that bigger perspective which enabled him to see things differently and so act differently when many of us would have simply collapsed in on ourselves in self-pity. Writing on Romans 8.28 that in all things God works for the good for those who love him, Warfield said this, 
The fundamental thought is the universal government of God. All that comes to you is under His controlling hand. The secondary thought is the favor of God to those who love Him. If He governs all, then nothing but good can befall those to whom He would do good. Though we're too weak to help ourselves and too blind to ask for what we need and can only groan in unformed longings, He is the author of those very longings. And He will also govern all things that we shall reap only good from all that befalls us. You see, this was no armchair theologian. He knew what he was talking about, having a faith rooted in Scripture and forged by experience. Well, as we've been seeing, someone else who had a similar faith, founded upon God's revelation and shaped over many years of heart-rending experience, was Joseph. As we shall see, he too believed that all that comes to us is under God's controlling hand with a special favor to those who love him. And in what in many ways is the climactic episode in the story, the astonishing nature of God's grace is displayed here with deep emotional intensity in a way which is really unparalleled anywhere else in Genesis. Now, first of all, we have the Revelation, chapter 45, verses 1 to 3. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Now, as we saw last week, jo Judah, uh, Joseph's uh, brother, had spoken from the heart. And in so doing, it showed a real transformation of the heart. And so it's not surprising that now Joseph is moved to the very depth of his being. In his previous encounters with his brothers, you'll remember Joseph has managed to somehow hold it all together. And when he couldn't, he removed himself from their presence to go into private, in private and cry until he composed himself. But not this time. No, he is so overwrought with emotion to the surprise of everyone and the utter consternation of his brothers he yells out the order for everyone to get out, leaving him alone with his brothers. He's so overcome with uncontrollable weeping that even those who are elsewhere in the palace could hear him way down the, the alleyway. Now, men of this status the prime minister of Egypt, no less, didn't do that sort of thing. So everyone in court must have wondered what was going on. And they were not the only ones. When the revelation is made, I am Joseph, we're told that his brothers couldn't speak because they were terrified. Now, the word used here is, is, is to describe paralyzing fear. It's like when we would say, well, someone was petrified. They were fixed to the spot. Now, why? <clears throat> well, when you think about it, up to this point, Joseph had only used a translator to speak to his brothers. But now he speaks to them in his own language. So they would have cottoned on that. That would have meant that, they'd, that he'd understood everything they'd said previously. What had they said? He had the power not only to jail them, but to torture them and kill them, if that is what he wanted to do. So a thousand and one thoughts would have been flashing through their minds as they looked at each other in desperation. Hands clammy, beads of sweat forming on their brow. 
This wasn't a dream in a story full of dreams. It was a nightmare. You see, not all revelation is pleasant, at least in the first instance. Here is God's man, Joseph, and in many ways God's savior, and yet he's been abused, he's been done away with by those who should have known better. And so when the revelation of Joseph takes place, the brothers are mortified. Now, do you not think that a similar reaction would have happened to Saul on the road to Damascus? When he realized that one for whom his heart was filled with hate was none other than the Lord of glory, Jesus. And when Jesus returns again, not veiled in the form of a small baby in a manger, but in splendid magisterial authority, what will be the reaction of those who have maligned him and his people? Well, the book of Revelation tells us. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. They're going to be seeing this. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. Revelation 1.7. It is no small matter coming face to face with the living God. Terror is the inevitable reaction if you are on the wrong side of him. But there's still the possibility of getting on the right side, and so we come to the reconciliation, chapter 45, 4 to 15. Now, Joseph caused them to, to draw a little nearer, and that would have intensified their terror when coupled with the second time he identified himself, I am Joseph with the added words, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, there's no mistaking who this is. And there's no mistaking what they've done. Now, if we think the emotion of Joseph was charged, what we see here is almost unparalleled anywhere else in the Bible, with the one possible exception of the response of the father to the younger son in Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Remember? What we see here is a beautiful choreography of authentic reconciliation. Did you notice how Joseph tries to put his brother's minds at ease in verse 5? He doesn't want them to be overwhelmed with distress. He's genuinely concerned for their future welfare and the rest of their family in verse 9. Oh, they may have packed him off to Egypt as a slave, but now he wants to bring them into Egypt as rich, free men protected from future famine, verse 11. He's going to be their provider. And just in case there's the slightest doubt that this was some sort of setup, a way of trapping the rest of the family so that Joseph could strike a final blow, like the one the Campbells did with the McDonald's in 1692 when they invited him over for supper and they knifed them. We see Joseph showing a display of raw emotion which could not be faked. Verse 14. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, every single one. Now tell me, what enabled Joseph to do that? The answer is that he had the same great vision of God and his good purposes later shared by Warfield. Look at what he says in verse 5. Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Verse 8. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God Verse 9, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. 
Do you see? It's all God, God, God. Now, this doesn't mean that the brothers can shrug off what they've done with a, well, that's all right then, isn't it? It was God's plan after all, and so didn't we do well? No. What they did was morally wrong. And they were personally responsible for what they had done. As Joseph reminded them, they had sold him into slavery. The fact that God has the power and the wisdom to work in and through evil human actions does not make them any less evil. It just shows how in control God is and how immensely kind and forbearing he is. And are we not grateful that it is so? As we look back on the mess-ups we've made in our lives, But what we also have here is a wonderful picture of the nature of true forgiveness. And this is worth pondering. It seems to me that we are living in a society, in a culture in the West, which is increasingly harsh in its condemnation, leaving no room for forgiveness. Just think of the furore surrounding the actor of Liam Neeson and his revelation that upon hearing of the rape of a friend, he pretty well lost it, and in a fit of revengeful rage, went out to beat up a black man, any black man. It was a dreadful thing to want to do. It was quite reprehensible and utterly shameful, which Neeson himself admitted. He was so gutted that he found himself capable of doing such a thing. He said so. He even went to a priest. The response of the new Pharisees? Well, not this could have been one of us, because we're all twisted. Not well done, Liam, for, for daring to admit such dreadful thoughts and repenting. No. It was he must pay and be seen to pay. That's where we're at. Now, thankfully, that was not Joseph's response to the injury done to him. And nor is it God's response to the injury we have done to his son. Real forgiveness is always costly. Inevitably, there is pain. You see it here with the loud wailing of Joseph, this deep personal anguish. For decades he'd been banished, spent years in prison, not knowing if his father, whom he loved so passionately, was alive, and the prospect of returning home to the land of promise seeming as remote as ever. Now, you would have to be superhuman or even subhuman not to feel any anger or hurt. So what are the options? Option one which is the preferred option of the Twitter mob, is to make the perpetrator suffer. They're not allowed to forget what they've done, and in some way or other, they're going to pay for it. Disgrace them, demean them, try and get them to lose their jobs if we can, but don't think of redeeming them. Somehow, they've got to pay off the debt. Now, Joseph had that option, he could have had his family functioning as slaves for the rest of their lives, and some may have thought, well, jolly well serves them right. The second option is more costly, forgiveness. There's no lashing out, giving as good as you got. There's simply the determination to let things go. But there is a cost. And it is a cost borne by the one who has been offended. This is the way Dr. Tim Keller puts it, speaking of forgiveness. He says, it is a form of suffering. You not only suffer the original loss of happiness, reputation, and opportunity, as did Joseph, 
but now you forego the consolation of inflicting the same on them. You are absorbing the debt, taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. It hurts terribly. Many people say it feels like a kind of death. Now that is what Joseph is doing. The tearing of his soul of which the weeping and the wailing were but expressions, occurred at this deep level because he chose to forgive. To forgive someone isn't a matter of engaging in make-believe, pretending things never really happened or it doesn't matter. It's the exact opposite. It involves looking at both the sin and the sinner squarely in the eye, saying it is wrong, wrong is wrong, even saying, you have hurt me, but I choose to forgive you. Putting the past behind so we can go forward together into the future. And what made this pain bearable for Joseph was the knowledge that God was in it all. Bringing about a greater good that no one could ever have imagined. In the short term, it was the salvation of the children of Israel and the rescuing of the surrounding nations. But in the long term, it was the salvation of the world. As from this family would come God's Messiah. You see? And as Christians, it's the bigger picture and the deeper understanding that this is how God acts, which should enable us to forgive those who have hurt us and hurt us badly. How does the Apostle Paul put it in Colossians 3? Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a, a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Our forgiveness, like all forgiveness costs, and it costs God the death of his son. So here's the option again. We tend to say, you sin, you pay. God in the gospel says, you sin, I pay. Then and only then, with forgiveness clearing away the barriers and healing of the scars, is reconcil reconciliation possible. And so we have this wonderful scene of, of Joseph hugging and, and kissing his brothers as if they were the only people in the world who really mattered. And at this point, it probably was the case. So let me ask, as you think on what has happened to Joseph, the betrayal, the miscarriage of justice, the lies told, the love denied, and yet the forgiveness shown, can you honestly say that someone, maybe here in this fellowship, who you feel has betrayed you, is beyond you forgiving them? When you or I stack up all the debts that we have incurred with God, and as he points us to the cross and says, the debt has been paid, I have paid it, I have borne the pain, is there not even a modicum of desire that we extend the same kind of forgiveness to other people? But we need to understand that forgiveness is not the end. It's a means to an end, a great end. We find forgiveness in Christ not simply that we can cleanse a guilty conscience, the negative, it is so we can have a restored relationship with God as our Father, the positive. And that's what we see here in the remaining verses, the restoration, verse chapter 45, 16 to 46 to 34. Now on this, I just want to say that it, in many ways, this is an anticipation of the exodus, which is going to occur some 400 years later, a few hundred years later. Let me explain. First of all, we have the presence of God in 46 verse 2. 
And God spoke to Israel, that is Jacob, in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am. He replied, I am God, the God of your father. He said, do not be afraid to go down into Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation. I will go down to Egypt with you. Now, did you notice there the echoes of God meeting Moses in the wilderness in the burning bush? When God called out to him, Moses, Moses, and Moses says, here I am, Lord. And Moses, too, was afraid to go down to Egypt. And God promised to be with him, as he did with Jacob. And God hasn't changed. Sometimes we are called to go to places we're uncertain about and which will make us feel uncomfortable. But the promise remains, I will be with you. Jacob believed that and acted upon it. How much more can we, who have the presence of God, in our lives by the Holy Spirit? Secondly, there are the promises of God to fulfill his covenant with Abraham. And that's why we've got this long list of Jacob's descendants in chapter 46, which ends with the announcement that 70 people went down into Egypt, verse 27. But, having in view a great nation which would come out of Egypt, mentioned in verse 3. So from this relatively small number, a ragtag group of people being placed far from the land of promise, the great promises of God to the world God's promise of salvation is going to come. And similarly, who would have thought that from that small number of fishermen and tax collectors in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, you would have billions of Christians in the 21st century throughout the world. You see, we worship the God of the impossible. He makes promises, he keeps them. Thirdly, there's the provision of God. You look at the generosity of Pharaoh in chapter 45, verse 16. Yes, Joseph plans on giving them land to be near him. Pharaoh wants them to have the best land possible. He orders carts to to be given, and no doubt in conjunction with Joseph, he loads them with goodies so they're going to be well provided for. They won't have to bother bringing their junk down into Egypt. All that they need, he will provide. And so they go out with their wagon train, piled high with treasure as a sign of blessing. Well, in this, in the Exodus, when the people of Israel leave, they do the same, carrying the spoils of the Egyptians, ready for the promised land. And likewise, we we, uh, the one we worship, who is the true Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he liberates us from sin and the devil, he does so by showering us with gifts for our good now and our new settlement in heaven. This is how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 4. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why he says, when he ascended on high, he took many captive and gave gifts to his people. So Christ himself gave, here are the gifts, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, to equip his people for works of service. Friends, God does not shortchange anybody who will put their trust in him. So let me ask, what do we really need to live a Christian life? Well, I guess you could name many things. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God's Word. We need the fellowship of God's people. But what we really need, which Warfield certainly knew and which Jacob was to discover afresh, can be summarized like this. I am God. I am in control. And I will bring to pass all that I have promised. And what God said to Jacob, he says to each one of us. Shall we pray?
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are this God and no other. We thank you that you are in control of all things, that you have good purposes for your people, even in the midst of suffering and loss. Dear Lord, there are great good ends in view. The great end being that we are conformed to the image of your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we pray that as we go out into the world this week, we would do so trusting in you, blessing you, and, Father, rejoicing in you. Amen.